Paul here in the beginning of 2 Timothy is arrested. He's in prison. And he's writing to encourage Timothy. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And he says, I remind you to stir up your faith. Now, Paul wants to also take away any sense of shame. Shame is when you are aware that something's not right, something's improper, something's not fitting. And you know, being arrested, being in prison, about to be executed, doesn't look good, does it? It looks like, whoa, done something bad, huh? Now you're going to pay for it with your life. And that can have a chilling effect. Anybody who's friends with Paul is going to be associated with him. Or you're friends of that guy in prison. How does that look? Well, you must be one of them too. So there's a a shame that's involved by association. Paul's already written about fear. Now he's writing about shame. And he says, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed, Timothy. Because God's eternal purpose and his eternal grace have come into this world to transform men's lives and to make them part of the solution, not part of the problem. To transform men's lives so that they do what is right even if they suffer for it because they know they'll be eternally vindicated. So we're reading in in the first chapter here From verse 8, Paul says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. So, right up to this point, Paul's been reminding Timothy to stir up his faith, to take away his fears. He does it by remembering how people in the past have dealt with the same difficult situation that it's never been easy to follow the Lord, to live for what is right. And so Paul's forefathers served God without staining their conscience, with a pure conscience. And Timothy's mother and grandmother, women in a very male society, yet they believed and they persevered. In trusting. And so it's never been easy. And you too, Timothy, you can do it by depending on the Holy Spirit. You've not received a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And now Tim, Paul wants Timothy to use that sound mind because you have to reason the facts out to a conclusion. You don't need to be ashamed, he says. Instead of being ashamed, join with in suffering for the gospel. Now, that wouldn't be your first conclusion, would it? Yes, I need to suffer for the gospel. Suffering is something we shy away from. 
because that involves a whole range of, of difficult emotions, feelings. You know, there's a, a lot of opposition to Paul and to the gospel. And Paul's experienced this for years. So is Timothy. You know that Paul was arrested in Jerusalem just standing in the temple. And there were Jews there trying to beat him and kill him. And he was taken out of the Jews' hands by the Roman centurion. And Paul had a chance to make a defense to them. And they listened to him to a certain point, And then they just went berserk. And they're throwing dust in the air. And they're saying, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he's not fit to live. That's their opinion of Paul and the gospel. In another time, Paul's making a defense uh, with the governor, Festus, in the audience. And as he's explaining his testimony and what happened to him, Festus all of a sudden bursts out, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Now, that's a polite way of saying, yes, Paul, you're obviously articulate, but you're crazy. You are crazy. And then when Paul finally gets to Rome as a prisoner, he calls the Jewish leaders there together to tell them about the Messiah. And they say, well, yeah, we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. It's a great introduction. Oh, you're one of them. Well, hey, we don't hear anything good about this at all. So would you explain it to us? So now he's in prison. That's not good. You don't like to mention your relatives that are in prison. But here he is talking about it. The testimony of our Lord Right there in verse 8. That's what's going to put you in a prison. That's what it, what's going to get people thinking you're crazy. That's what some people will think, away with a fellow like that from the earth, he's not fit to live. So the temptation would be to consider this shameful. This testimony of Jesus. But Paul says, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner. Now, the testimony of our Lord is an interesting way to put the gospel, isn't it? He could have just said the gospel here. But he says specifically, the testimony of our Lord. And we remember that Jesus himself made the good testimony before the Roman governor, Pilate. Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, it is as you say, declaring himself to be the Messiah. And you know, he suffered for that. He suffered death. And then here's Paul. But he says, I'm not just a prisoner, I am his prisoner. That is, yes, the Romans have me in prison. And yes, I was accused by some Jew or some person who didn't like me. But I'm not that guy's prisoner, and I'm not Rome's prisoner. I am God's prisoner. And whatever happens in my life and these sufferings that happen, they're all ordained by God. They're his sufferings. And he says, join with, join with me in the sufferings for the gospel. You know, not like it's a shameful thing or a crime or something to live down. But he says, come on. He says, embrace this, glory in it. The opposite of ashamed. I tried to look up what's the opposite of ashamed. 
And the dictionary doesn't do so good with this one. Everybody here knows what ashamed is, but what's the opposite? And I think it's glory in it. Take ownership. Claim your share. Join with. Now, there's a a small ambiguity here, right at the very end. Share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Now, how do you take that? According to the power of God, what does that modify? Does it modify the gospel, that the gospel is according to the power of God? Or does it modify the sufferings? That is, Join in these sufferings according to the power of God. Suffer, suffer with the power of God in these sufferings. I've gone back and forth over the years as I wonder which one it modifies. Does it modify the sufferings or the gospel? And in the end, I decide it means both. Because you can see that the gospel is not according to the power of man, it is according to the power of God. That's what Paul says in Romans 1, verse 16, I believe it is, either 16 or 18. don't have it right here in front of me. But he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So there it is. It's the gospel according to the power of God. And yet... He's just said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And this is how we're supposed to suffer, not according to our own strength, but according to the power of God. Both makes perfect sense. So the gospel is according to the power of God. And I noticed that from verse 9, right there in the middle according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. God has a purpose. It's the purpose of the ages. His master plan, why he created the worlds, what is it all coming to? In chapter 1 of Ephesians, Paul says that God wants to sum everything up in Christ. And those, and that which will not be summed up in Christ is going to be removed and taken away. What's left is everything in Christ so that God is in all and everything in God. Right now, that's not the case. This world is under the domination of the devil There are principalities and powers, angelic rulers who are not submitted to God, not summed up in God. So there's a huge conflict going on right now. But this is the purpose of God, to sum up everything in Christ. And to do that, he's provided grace. His favor that is so favorable, it goes far beyond what you could ever expect to hope from God. So it should blow some of your circuits when you think about the grace of God. And in this case, it's talking about the enabling of God. Not just that he has a purpose, but that he enables those who receive Jesus. Now, What I notice about this is that this purpose and this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So this is talking about eternity. The purpose of God is eternal. That means it can never be changed. It can't be altered. It can't be thwarted. It can't be derailed or stopped, or forgotten. You know, anything I start can be thwarted, stopped, forgotten. 
I got so many projects laying around, half finished. I actually have to get God to grab me by the throat to actually finish one. It has to be his timing. But see, God isn't like me. He purposes in eternity. And therefore, that purpose to save to the uttermost, it cannot be changed. And this grace that he gives, the enabling, the favor that he gives is also eternal, which means nothing can thwart that grace. Nothing can make that grace ineffectual. Nothing can cut off that grace or make it stop somehow. And God determined all this before he even made the world. You just kind of went right there. Because you try to think about before anything was, and there's only God. And so here is God making his determination, deciding that Jesus would be the sacrifice that would restore everyone who believes in that sacrifice to himself. All this is worked out in advance. It wasn't a plan B like, oops, I never thought Adam would do that. Gee, I told him not to do that. But look what he's done. What do we do now? God wasn't surprised. All of that was known to God and God even allowed it to work out his purposes. Now, here's the stupendous thing. That God has his eternal purpose, his eternal enabling to accomplish this purpose, and then he brings these two things into this world, which is temporary. It runs on time, not that the buses run on time or the trains run on time, but everything runs according to time. We're stuck in time. Time passes. All the seconds tick and the hours and the days and the months and the years happen. And God has brought eternal purpose and eternal grace into this temporary world. That's what he says in verse 10. It has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, that word for appearing of our Savior, it's the word from which we get the English word epiphany. You know, when you've just had this realization and you get it, it's actually from a word that means If a God should appear, wow, epiphany, that's what we have. Jesus, the Son of God, comes into the world and he appears and he abolishes death and he brings life and immortality to light. He abolished death. That is a good trick. Because nobody can escape death. Nobody can just say, well, you're done. You're out of business. But he did it by taking all of our sins upon himself and dying. And then he rose from the dead. In that act of power, he has abolished death. And what that means is, For the one who receives Jesus never has to be separated from God because that's what death means. Never have to be separated from God to the point where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, yet he shall live. So, There's this promise of the resurrection, just like Jesus. Jesus is first, 
That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, the first fruits of the dead. And then he says, everyone in their order, everyone who's believed in Jesus is going to rise from the dead. But even now, they're not separated from God. And this is Paul's victory that he mentions in Romans 8, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If anything were to be able to separate us, we would die. But he says, you know, nothing can, and that includes death. When the believer in Jesus dies, he goes straight to be with the Lord. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians 5. We know that if this tent, this temporary structure is destroyed, we have a building made without hands in the heavens, eternal. And he says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So Jesus abolished death. And he has brought life and immortality to light. Immortality, more properly, incorruptibility, which means it's impossible that there be any spoiling, rottenness, sickness, infirmity. That means that those of us who really know what it's like to be sick will never know that again but we're going to know that power of an endless life. So, he abolished death. You know that if you don't have to pay for your sins, you don't have to die. And that's the whole point of Jesus dying on the cross. Now, the eternal purpose and grace of God call us to a different life. I'm going back now to verse 9. It says, He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. To see, everything we've done up until the time that He calls us only prepares us for eternal death. All of our sins separate us from God. So he doesn't call us according to our works and he doesn't call us to live anymore according to our works. He calls us to live according to his own purpose and his own grace. That's what our lives are about. And that's why he says he's called us with a holy calling. And it's, it begins with this call to repent. And it's important. Jesus says if you don't repent... You can't follow me. Repent means to change your mind. And because you change your mind, you change the direction of your life, the way it's going. Before, I think, well, you know, I just want to be happy. I just want to want my own thing. That's all I want. Isn't that okay? I just want to be happy. But God says, no, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is death. And so you have to repent of, I just want my own way to say, you know what? I want God's purpose for my life. That is the most important thing. Not my will, but yours be done. That is the way that Jesus thought, and that is the way that everyone who was born of Jesus, born again, born from above, thinks so as to live the rest of the time in the body, not for the will of men, but for the will of God. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter 4. So, now we got a purpose, a holy calling. And Paul talks about that in verse 11. To which I was appointed, a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. You know, before he met Jesus, he was a persecutor, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, an arrogant and ignorant blasphemer. But Jesus called him to his own purpose 
says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to be a preacher of my word. You will proclaim me. You will be an apostle because you have seen me raised from the dead and you will be my witness. He says, you're also going to teach the Gentiles. That is, you're going to go to people who are far off from me, who have no promises, no covenants, no reason why I should give them the time of day, and I want you to proclaim the forgiveness of their sins. Proclaim that there is eternal life and it can be had in the name of Jesus and then teach them how it works. So I have a whole new purpose for your life and it's to do my will. You're working for me now. And so, you know, this eternal life brings with it new purpose. Everyone who receives Jesus has a part to play in the purpose of God. It transforms a person's life to be a holy person. That's why he calls it a holy calling. Every believer in Jesus is a holy person, a saint. The Hebrew for this would be chasid. And it means someone who is in fellowship with God, who lives the same way as God, in a holy way. And I found out the other day that that word chasid is related to the word that describes the love of God, chesed. And that is absolutely fitting because Paul makes the connection in 1 Thessalonians 3 with the idea of love and holiness. He says, 1 Thessalonians 3, 12, and make the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. He says, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. If you're going to be holy, you need to grow in love. And as you grow in love, you will grow in holiness. But you can't grow without the other. You can't say, well, I'm going to be love and not have this idea of holiness. You can't say, I'm going to be holy, but I'm going to be harsh and inflexible. I'm going to wear black all the time, except for my shirt, which will be white. And I don't know why, that just seems to be the uniform. But black and white, and I'm going to be holy, and woe to you if you get in my way. Nope, he puts together the idea of holiness and love. God's chasid is going to be filled with chesed, the love of God. That's what makes a holy person. And you know, this means you're no longer part of the problem. You're not somebody who just says, I want my own way, just like everybody else in the parking lot at Sainsbury's. And everybody else trying to get a seat on the tube and get to where they need to be and live their lives and just total chaos and a coldness and a lack of love. He says, you know what? I live for your purposes to love you and to love everyone around me. That's my purpose from here on in. Now, Paul says, for this reason, I also suffer these things. And here's this huge contradiction. You only want to do what's right, to bear witness to the truth, and to love everybody around you. And what does that result in? Suffering. See, there's two opinions here. There's the opinion of this world 
which is caught up in time. And the essence of this world is it's in rebellion against God. And the Bible says, it hates me without a cause. And you may have experienced this when you try to tell people about Jesus, is that all of a sudden there's a drawing away and there's a sense of, I wish you hadn't done that. I regret ever trying to get friendly with you because all of a sudden you've sprung out this thing on me. I hope it stays with you. I don't want it. I even did that coming home from York on the train. You know, we're sitting at, a, at one of those tables on the train and there's four seats and three of us and one gentleman. And we sit down and start talking to him and he's nice, we're nice, everybody's nice. And then I tell him what I do. She hadn't done that. Kind of ruined everything. And I go, well, you know, all I do is I, I teach what the Bible says. And, I, and God doesn't really want to take anything away from us. He wants to give us the forgiveness of our sins. He wants to give us eternal life. Here's my card. I, I teach what the Bible says, and I don't put any spin on it. Why don't you check it out just for kicks? It'll be safe. Nobody will get you. He goes, maybe I might. He doesn't throw it away first. Yeah. But see, why should this be a big deal? Why should there be this initial sort of hostility, this kind of like, Ugh. I don't want to hear about that. Just be nice to me. Well, you know, to be forever separated from God in misery doesn't sound nice to me. I thought I was being nice to you. See, this is the opinion of the world. The world says, you know what? You can do anything you want. You can believe anything you want as long as you don't believe in Jesus. As long as you don't say that he is the son of God and he is the only way to God and he died for our sins and he rose from the dead. You can believe anything else you want. You can believe the world is flat. You can do anything you want, but not that. Because if you do that, then if you tell somebody on the job, like say a Muslim, then we're going to sack you immediately for harassment. And we're going to say that you're Islamophobic or that you're homophobic. And we're going to make sure that you never get justice in court, ever. And, you know, you're going to lose your bakery business. You're going to lose your bed and breakfast business. So, the world says, you know what? We're going to call you bigoted and hateful because you can believe anything you want, follow anything you want, except that. Now, you know, that's in this country. In other countries, they'll just kill you. They'll send a suicide bomber into your church or they'll cut your head off and videotape it, put it on the, the internet. So... That's one opinion. But the other opinion is what you say when you know the facts. And when you have thought the facts through with a sound mind, with sober judgment, you say what Paul said to Festus after Festus said, you're crazy. He says, I'm not Crazy, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. You know, at that moment, it wasn't Paul that was looking crazy, it was Festus. People get really bothered about this, but we have no reason to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, or of Paul the prisoner, or of Saeed in Iran or of the behavior of the Christians in Iraq or in India 
or Pakistan or wherever Christians are being persecuted all over the planet right now this second, we don't have any reason to be ashamed. Who's right here? Are men right or is God right? Paul says, nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed. Paul says, I'm not dealing with fairy tales here. I know him. And he is God. And he is true. He says, I'm persuaded that he's able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Now, God has sent eternal things into this temporary world, right? But you know, we can also send temporary things to eternity for safekeeping. Jesus talked about that. Don't lay up treasures on earth where moth eats, rust destroys, thieves steal. But he says, lay them up in heaven. See, we can take temporary things and lay them up in eternity because Jesus brought eternity into this temporary world. And Paul says, I have deposited something with God. He says, I think he's able to keep it. And this is what he's referring to. It's in 1 Peter chapter 4. And you know, the whole chapter and all of 1 Peter is about suffering now because of the glory that's to be revealed. And so this is what he says in, in 1 Peter 4 verse 12. He says, Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. This is what Paul did. As he said, I'm going to commit my soul to God. I'm going to lay up the responsibility in the future of my soul to God in eternity. And then he says, I'm not ashamed. He says, I'm persuaded. I'm convinced that he can keep what I've deposited with him. You know, you take your money to Barclays, don't you? Those of you who don't take your money to Lloyd's, and for the most part, they're sort of guaranteed by the government that they can keep it. But even those guys can blow billions. They can lose all sorts of money. But here's God. If you deposit your soul with him, he's going to keep it forever. And Paul says, you know what? That's what I've done. I know him whom I've believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. So, in that day, that refers to when Jesus is revealed, 
when we who have believed in Jesus are revealed in glory and everyone is vindicated who's believed in Jesus. This is what Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And he says, We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you suffer, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So Paul says, you know, there's a day coming when I am going to be vindicated from all this suffering, all of this shame and embarrassment that I have endured. But he says, I'm going to reach that day. I'm going to make it. I'm not going to be ashamed. I am going to be vindicated. And the reason why is so glorious. Because this purpose of God and this grace of God is eternal. And Paul is partaking of that grace right now. We partake of that grace. And you know that grace is eternal. All of our adversaries, even these angelic rulers that have rebelled against God, all of them are temporary. They're not going to last forever. We are going to outlast all of them. So, here are some things to encourage us. We know Jesus a little bit, don't we? We need to know him a lot more. Because the more we know him, the less we're going to be ashamed. We know Jesus just enough so that if it should come up and we're not prepared, we're ashamed and we don't open our mouths. We don't stick up. Because we think, well, I don't know enough. What if they ask me a question I can't answer? I'll look stupid. I better keep my mouth shut. But you know, there is that aspect that we're going to look stupid even if we had every answer in the book. All the reasoning in the world doesn't impress somebody who doesn't want to think. So you know, we'd look stupid even if we could explain it to their own satisfaction. It just goes along with the territory. So we need to know him a lot so that we can give a defense. But you know, just so that we cannot be ashamed if we give that offense and they still think we're crazy. We need to know him. And that means we always have to be a learner. There's never a time when we can say, you know what, I think I know it all. I'll just coast. Because there's always more to learn about Jesus. And that knowledge, knowing him, is what makes us glory in him. Whatever the opposite of ashamed turns out to be, I think it's glory. We will glory in Jesus and not be ashamed to suffer for that because you know what? We know that these sufferings are temporary and they can only kill you once. And after that, they can do no more. But 
we are trusting in him who is keeping what we have committed to him until that day. And the question is, have you committed your soul to God? And that's something that we can think about every day. To commit ourselves to him and say, you know, Lord, if this is my day, if I'm to go out in a blaze of glory today, I'm going to trust in you. Because you're good, you're faithful, and you're eternal. And I commit my soul to you this day for safekeeping. You know, we are going to suffer in this dark, fallen world. And not everybody who sins against God is going to get punished with a bolt of lightning immediately. So anybody can do anything they want. They can be arrogant, abusive. They can be snobs. They can make us feel embarrassed that we ever opened our mouths and said something like, Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for our sins and rose again from the dead. People can do anything they want for now. And then everybody has to stand before God and give an account of their lives. You know, at that point, we're not going to be ashamed. But they are going to be greatly ashamed. Maybe they can walk around like Richard Dawkins right now and just feel like, man, it doesn't matter what anybody says, I am right. And anybody who disagrees with me is stupid and should go to a concentration camp. That's what he said. And, you know, he's got a Ph.D., a bunch of degrees from Oxford, maybe. Everybody goes, ooh, ah, Richard Dawkins. Well, the day will come. That day. And then we'll see who is glorying and who is ashamed. You know, we're going to bear the glory forever they are going to bear their shame forever. Our sufferings are brief and light. Their sufferings will be eternally weighty and forever. So here's the use of a sound mind to reason these things out, to know God, and to say... For this cause I suffer these things, yet I am not ashamed. For I know him whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are right and good. There's no evil in you. And so the world hates you without a cause. There's no injustice with you. No oppression. No sneakiness. No wickedness. Your purpose is to bless. To give life abundantly. We thank you, Lord, for that good news according to your power that saves us and changes us. We're so glad. And we pray, Lord, to know you, that we would never be ashamed of you. But even if we suffer, it's brief, it's momentary, and the glory is eternal. Thank you, Lord, for this confidence that we have. And so, Lord, we pray that you would teach us by your Holy Spirit to know you. Even as we learn about you, help us to know you. And give us that life and immortality. 
Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see.